Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 15th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. No apologies have been received for the meeting, so we'll move straight on to agenda item one, which is a transport update. Before we do actually that, could we invite members to declare any interest <coughs> relevant to this item? Uh, Stuart. Um, I register of interest shows me as the Honorary President of the Scottish Association of Public Transport and the Honorary Vice President of Rail Future UK. Okay, Gail. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Honorary Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line. Um, John. First Party Group in Rail and a member of the Parliamentary RMT Group. Okay. Uh, this evidence session is a regular update to the Committee on Transport Policy and Projects in Scotland from the Minister of Transport and the Islands. So I'd like to welcome Hamza Youssef, the Minister of Transport and the Islands, Bill Reeve, the Director of Rail, Margaret Horne, the Head of Ferries Policy and Contract Management, uh, Joanna Boyle, Head of Sustainable Active Travel, and Gary Cox, the Head of Aviation. Uh, Minister, would you like to make a short opening statement? Uh, a brief opening statement indeed, uh, I shall. Uh, thank you, Convener, for allowing me to start this session uh, with a brief overview, and it will be brief. Uh, in terms of uh, our trunk road uh, network, it will be no surprise since my last update, uh, we of course uh, had that severe uh, winter and experienced that severe uh, weather. As a result of that, we had an extended period of freeze, thaw, uh, snow, rain cycles uh, this winter. That uh, somewhat uh, accelerated the deterioration of localised sections of our carriageway. Of course, local roads uh, felt that uh, as well. In terms of our own uh, responsibilities, Transport Scotland's trunk road response led to reprioritising £6 million uh, towards over 90 uh, patching or larger resurfacing schemes across uh, the network. Uh, the trunk road uh, response also included deployment of additional maintenance crews and road signage, as well as um, targeted and focused uh, media updates. Uh, a number of areas in the trunk road network were particularly uh, affected, uh, and, and we discussed them in a recent uh, uh, members' debate uh, in Parliament. Uh, notwithstanding uh, some of the weather challenges, uh, some of the highlights on our roads, uh, we've pushed forward with uh, essential upgrading. Uh, the iconic route alongside the, uh, along the, the side of Loch Lomond, Tarbet and Vernarnan, uh, is progressing and pressing ahead with the preferred route option. Uh, in February, we awarded £3.4 million pounds towards ground investigation, and that uh, progresses uh, at, uh, at a good uh, pace. Uh, following route uh, options assessment, Transport Scotland announced also their preferred option, which was option three for the A9, A96 inches to Smithson, Smithton uh, Link Road. Uh, and that, again, uh, is progressing, as well as uh, grade separation work at A982 Longman Roundabout, uh, as well as, of course, uh, AWPR uh, and, indeed, uh, further schemes as well. Uh, Transport Bill, uh, we intend to bring forward and introduce to the Parliament uh, next month. Uh, I have already uh, very publicly uh, said that they will have some measures around uh, buses, uh, of course, responsible parking, smart and integrated multimodal ticketing, uh, as well as uh, low emission zones, um, RTP finance, uh, some uh, elements on the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner and indeed a technical uh, technical uh, legislation uh, or proposal, sorry, on the Scottish Canals Board uh, as well. In terms of rail, um, within the £5 billion spent on the Scottish Rail Network, uh, we, there will be major investment in new and refurbished rolling stock, over 475 million, uh, being invested in ScotRail's rolling stock, which will deliver major enhancements to train facilities, increasing seating capacity by 23% uh, by, by 2019, and further uh, to that once we can run uh, eight car services as well. Uh, we recently published our rail enhancement and capital investment strategy in March this year. Uh, and taking measures to tackle uh, overcrowding, and, and the committee will be well aware uh, of the continued uh, the continued uh, measures we take and ScotRail take to improve uh, performance right across the network. In terms of ferries, uh, we have provided uh, money to CMAL, uh, Caledonian Maritime Asset Limited, to allow them to purchase three passenger vessels that serve the Northern Isles. That will guarantee uh, the lifeline connections to and from Orkney and Shetland. Uh, we have, of course, committed to roll out uh, to the Northern Isles the uh, RET, uh, which has already been a major success on the West Coast, and, of course, continuing discussions with both Orkney and Shetland Council around their internal ferries and a long-term solution. Uh, there have been some challenges, it would be fair to say, in the Clyde and Hebrides, 
uh, network uh, in the start of summer, uh, largely due to issues with the Klansmen. Uh, but uh, again, uh, our, uh, and, uh, and the CalMax, of course, number one priority is to maintain and ensure sustainability of lifeline services. Uh, the NTS review, which again, I'm, I'm not going to go into uh, any amount of detail here, but the National Transport Strategy Review is very much ongoing, progressing on schedule, and of course, work starting on the review, uh, early work starting on the STPR review, which will follow after the NTS uh, review and engagement with local communities has been central to that NTS review, and I'm pleased that we've covered uh, from north to south, east to west in, 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 in that regard. Um, we're pushing ahead also with uh, uh, our uh, commitments to decarbonise transport and do our part. The transport is a large emitter of CO2 emissions. There's a number of strands uh, that we're looking to take forward. In that regard, low emission zones, uh, of course, are one of the key ones. Delighted that Glasgow is being the first city to introduce low emission zones by the end of this year. Uh, that will be followed by the three other largest cities and then other air quality management areas. There, after, and again, happy to talk to the detail of that uh, in a bit more detail. And active travel, of course, is another part of that. Uh, active travel, our commitment to double our budget from 40 million to 80 million, uh, well underway. Uh, we've made some good announcements in that regard in terms of the most recent uh, increasing our community links uh, funding. But there's still a lot more that we are looking to do, we will be doing, uh, and indeed that we're happy to update Parliament. So I think I will leave it at that as a quick kind of run through uh, parts of the portfolio that I think were relevant from uh, the last uh, last conversation that we had. But of course, there's much more I could talk about, and I'm sure we will get into the meat of uh, and happy to take questions. Camino. Uh, thank you, Minister. And the first question is going to come from me on a subject uh, which you didn't cover in the opening uh, section, so it's probably appropriate that I raise it now. The Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme um, and the cost for this project, uh, original cost at 742 million, projected now, I believe, at 858 million. The Office of Rail, Road and Rail Regulation are very concerned about this 160 million pound increase. That's a huge increase, Minister. Could you give us some explanation on, on why that's occurred and whether you think that that demonstrates good project management? Well, you know, I've been to this committee previously to talk about Egypt and express my disappointment at uh, the way that uh, rail projects have been delivered. Uh, and, of course, network rail, and it's important for me. Uh, of course, the committee will be aware of this, but to restate it on the network uh, record, of course, network rail is a reclassified body under the Department for Transport. I would love to have uh, greater control. It's important to say that its infrastructure, its engineering, and its timetable functions are still headquartered in Milton Keynes in England. I would like to have control and greater control over that. Now, that is not uh, to say, of course, that there aren't things that we can do. So when the, if you remember, we instigated the Ernst & Young report, uh, Ernst & Young report, when we first started to hear of uh, the enormous cost rises across real projects, Egypt being one of them. Uh, and one of the things that we did to try to minimise that was have better governance. So we have the, the major projects portfolio board, which is chaired by my chief executive, uh, Roy Brennan, uh, of Transport Scotland. And that stricter governance uh, certainly helps to flush out some of the issues we've seen. Now, some of the projects we've seen cost increases, and some of them actually, because of the intervention, we've seen cost reduction. I think Highland Mainline would be an example of where we've seen some, some uh, cost, uh, millions of pounds, tens of millions of pounds of cost uh, reduction. So, uh, you know, no, I'm, I'm not pleased by, by the fact that Network Rail, uh, their anticipated final cost, I should say, is, is I haven't been given their uh, absolute final cost on this, but their anticipated final cost has risen to that. I suppose just to, just to give some reassurance to the committee, because we all around this table want to see Egypt uh, complete and, and, and the other major projects complete, that they are still, Network Rail, in fairness to them, are still within the financial envelope of Control Period 5. In fact, they'll come in underneath uh, that financial envelope of Control Period 5. So that contingency, you know, is built in there. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not happy about that. And, uh, that is why, for the next Control Period, I've instructed a different approach to major rail projects. You, you use the word there, anticipated final position. Are you anticipating, therefore, that... <laughs> That's the, the price is actually going to go up, and, and this isn't the, the end of the bad news story on cost increases? That is the, you know, that is really the, the term is anticipated final cost because Network Rail haven't written to me formally 
to say to me, this is the final cost of the project. Now, uh, I will press them for that. They say they need a little bit more time to, to, to go through whatever processes they absolutely have to do so. Uh, but uh, that is the anticipated final uh, cost that is, is, is of course, uh, uh, been touted in the media that the ORR confirmed that uh, Network Rail uh, have confirmed, but they have not written to me to give me what their final cost is. I reserve judgment until they do that. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm surprised you, you phrased it in the way that they've not written to you. Surely you, you should be writing to them and pushing them very hard on that answer. And if you have been pushing them very hard, are you, are you convinced that, that they've given you the right answers? I've, of course I push them hard. Every time I speak to the MD of the Scott Rail Alliance and every time I speak to uh, Network Rail, and you know that they're in the midst of appointing a new chief exec, uh, we talk about major rail projects. Uh, but at the same time, they're coming back to me to say these are the anticipated final costs and they intend to come to me uh, with the final costs. Until I get the final costs, it would be wrong for me to uh, hypothecate, to speculate, to crystal ball uh, gaze into what that final figure would look like. I would prefer to be told uh, from them. But the anticipated final cost in itself that anticipated final cost, you know, I'm not happy about the fact that it's risen uh, by the number it's risen, and network, role, network Rail know that I'm unhappy about that. Sorry, uh, just one further question on that, Minister, before I move on to John with the next question. You say they haven't written to you. How many times have you written to them, pushing them on the final cost? I don't know uh, how many times I've written to them, but I speak, to, as I say, to the MD on, on a regular uh, occasion, probably weekly I speak to the MD of Network Rail, but at the same time, it's, I am understanding that they have to go through a process to get the final cost. So I'm happy to give them the time and the space that they need to get that final cost. I'm, um, I have always promised, uh, if you look at the f previous transcripts that have come to this committee, that uh, I would update the committee first when I got the final costs. So uh, when I get those final costs, of course, uh, I will, the committee and the parliament will be the first ones to know. And is it right ORR is doing a review on this project? And uh, can I just have a clarification of your input into that? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah. The ORR are doing an investigation into this project. Are, are you inputting into that? Yeah, I meet with the ORR on a regular uh, basis. In fact, I think I'm meeting with them possibly uh, later today uh, as well. So we're having a conversation uh, around that. The ORR, I have to say, have been excellent. Uh, in this. Uh, the independent regulator is the right person to come forward with uh, a report uh, uh, without putting words at all in their mouth. They have been kept up to date on what our plans are for CP6 and how we intend to take that approach. Uh, you know, I'm sure the committee can, can question them in, in their own time if they wish, but I, I think that conversation with the ORR has been very positive. Uh, my official bill, Reeves, reminds me, of course, that one of the, the, the reasons for not having the final cost yet is that negotiations are still very much ongoing uh, between Network Rail and other stakeholders around the claims that they've made. So you'll remember that when I came to the committee to previously talk about Egypt, one of the major issues uh, for, for, for the rise in cost has been the delay because of the issues around regulator, regulatory rail compliance. Now, you know, those kind of discussions uh, and the claims and uh, counterclaims uh, are still ongoing, so that's why the final cost, I have to give Network Rail the appropriate time to, to, to go through those negotiations. Uh, once I have that final cost, though, my commitment has always been uh, to let the committee know. Okay, John. Thanks, Convener. Um, if I remember correctly, I mean, when Jacobs, I think it was, came in and did a study, they actually reduced the cost of Egypt at the beginning because we were lengthening the platforms at Queen Street Station and that reduced the cost in other ways. And I think at that time we're criticised for spending less money in Egypt, but now clearly you've been criticised for spending more. G can you tell us how Queen Street Station is progressing? Is, is it going okay? I was delighted to be at uh, Queen Street Station recently to see the extended platform uh, one. You know, it's is going well, and uh, you know the, the timescales uh, that we've publicly uh, announced uh, are the ones that we're still, of course, uh, intend on, on on pushing Network Rail uh, to. What I would say around Queen Street is uh, it's difficult going there and seeing it for myself. You are in a confined city centre space. Now, you don't have an open building site as you might have in, in other construction projects. You have a very confined space. Uh, and within that, you've still got to operate a train station. Uh, therefore, I can understand why people's experience of Queen Street is, 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 is uh, not the best. Uh, but uh, where I do take comfort, having spoke to 
transport focus on this uh, is that King's Cross, when it was getting redeveloped, was uh, the most unpopular station and is now the number one st uh, popular station. So I'm hoping uh, that when Queen Street's um, uh, building works uh, are complete, then it is uh, uh, one of the most uh, popular stations in, in, in the entire UK. Hey, thanks very much. Moving on to the kind of rolling stock side of things, uh, I mean, as you probably know, we had a very detailed session with Alec Hines last week, and I don't want to go over all of that again, but I suppose my overall question would be, are you happy with the way that ScotRail has dealt with the rolling stock situation? There's issues with the windscreens and the new electric trains, therefore there's more diesels running, therefore there's a delay in introducing the kind of quicker service. Um, but overall, do you think they're handling that properly? Do you know, I've never been shy of coming to this committee and uh, where ScotRail have had failures, for example, previously in, in, in performance, being very explicit about how disappointed, uh, how angry and frustrated I've been about that. I have to say on the, on the issue of the 385s in particular, uh, you know, of course there are things that could have been done better and, and managed better potentially by, by, by ScotRail, but uh, really the delay has been in the manufacturing. So Hitachi is the manufacturer. Uh, you know, they have apologised repeatedly, not just to me, but also uh, to the First Minister, actually, for uh, the, the, the faults that they have had. Uh, now, you have to have some understanding, of course, and I do have some understanding that it's a new plant in Newton Aycliffe, there's a new workforce in Newton Aycliffe, etc., etc. Uh, but even with that, uh, a company, the global footprint of Hitachi, to have some of the most basic problems that they've had around supply chain, for example, for me, are, are just not acceptable. Um, so, uh, no, I'm, I'm not satisfied, but I wouldn't put the blame uh, squarely at all on this one, uh, on ScotRail. They've got a job to do to try to mitigate uh, some of those delays so that passengers aren't the ones that, that, that lose out. And I'm pleased that they've uh, come to, to, to find some rolling stock 365s uh, for, for this summer, which will make a, a big, big difference. Um, but, uh, you know, it is a disappointing uh, position that we're in. But from a government point of view, I can give you and every committee member every reassurance that uh, we are pushing Hitachi, not just myself, but in fact, from the First Minister herself intervening uh, on a number of occasions uh, with Hitachi to, to get the message across that we expect them to deliver on their promises. And, and moving on then to the kind of financial impact of this, I mean, are Hitachi paying uh, at all? Is there... Is there penalties or compensation, or, or are ScotRail having to find extra money to bring in the 365s? How, do, how does that all work? Uh, undoubtedly, with these things, it uh, ends up in the hands of lawyers. So, uh, you know, ScotRail will put in for liquidated damages, Hitachi will make counterclaims, and these things will, will drag on and be settled by lawyers, or if it has to go to courts, it'll be settled by courts, and so on and so forth. Uh, for me, uh, that is a that is an issue that ScotRail and Hitachi have to sort out. My immediate concern is making sure that there's rolling stock there for passengers uh, and ensuring that not only is there uh, the, 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 what we have currently, but where can we make enhancements, and hence why uh, this uh, uh, the, the 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 proposal to bring through uh, 365s is very very welcome uh, indeed. Uh, now we pushed uh, Abelio hard on that that they had to find a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. Uh, and I have to say, when we spoke to the head of of, of Abelio in the Netherlands, in fact, um, you know that message was communicated very very strongly and. I'm really pleased that ScotRail have, have managed to come to, uh, as I say, bring forward this proposal of the 365s. I think it's going to be, although a stopgap measure, uh, one that will be welcomed by passengers and commuters. So that is my job in terms of the who pays and liquidated damages, although I keep an interest in that. Of course, it's an issue between ScotRail and Hitachi. But just to tie it up, that you're not anticipating that the public purse will have to pay any extra around of the, the rolling stocks? Not, not for the 365, so no, not for the 365. Uh, they won't be. That will be paid by ScotRail. And then, of course, uh, if they claim off Hitachi and so on, that will be a, a conversation they'd have to have with the manufacturer. Thank you. Uh, Richard, you want to come in? And then Jamie Green afterwards. On, on the question that you put in earlier, convener. Right. Network Rail is based in uh, the headquarters of Milton Keynes, you said? So, what responsibility do you personally have for Network Rail? I mean, Network Rail are not accountable to me. They're, they're a reclassified body under the Department for Transport. And as I say, the infrastructure engineering and timetabling functions are, are headquartered south of the border. So, they're, they're not accountable to me nor accountable to this parliament. 
Yes, uh, under the Department for Transport. So Secretary of State is the accountability. I think there's, there's, the, there's a genuine uh, and a sensible conversation to be had with, with all of those around this table, I mean, all political parties, around where we think it would be sensible for Network Rail to be devolved to Scotland. And my position would be that full, full control you know, is, is what I desire. But I understand that that's not the position of everybody uh, and all the political parties here. What I would well, what I would really like to do is have a kind of cross-party conversation about, well, where do they think it would be sensible for Network Rail to be devolved? If they overspend, who, who, who pays the bill? You? Um, I don't. I mean, at the moment, uh, yeah, essentially, uh, would be the answer. But uh, you know, they at the moment are not anticipated to go over the financial envelope for control period five. But yes, ultimately, if they overspend, the Scottish taxpayer would have to. Uh, if we've committed to these projects, we'd have to to find the funding for that. I'll just double check with my official. But uh, yes, uh, that would be uh, that would be for us to to find the funds. Jamie. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, panel. Um, the first electric trains were due to begin operation in December 2016. Uh, here we are two and a half years later, and there's not a single Class 35 carriage operating on the network. So can I ask the Minister specifically uh, when he thinks the 385s will be running live on the network with passengers? Uh, secondly, when he thinks we will be achieving 42-minute journey times between Glasgow and Edinburgh. There seems to be slippage on that as well. And thirdly, can I press him on the cost of the leasing of these 365s? I can't imagine it's cheap to lease uh, a train these days. Uh, I'm surprised that the minister didn't answer Mr. Mason's question on the cost of it. Uh, so I wonder if I could press that a little bit further. Yeah. Um, let me just try to give some reassurances to the member. There's obviously some things that I can go into detail on. Some of it, of course, understandably, is uh, commercially sensitive. Uh, and I, I will come to that in, in, in a second. In terms of uh, the electric trains, uh, it should be said that over 30% of the services uh, that, that operate uh, between Edinburgh, Falkirk High and, and, and Glasgow, Queen Street, uh, are electric since December 2017. Uh, this will rise to more than 90% when that interim fleet of the 365s come into play. So that answers this question directly. So the majority of them, the vast majority, 90%, uh, should be electric on that route uh, when the interim 365 trains are introduced later this summer ahead of the 385 fleet uh, coming in. So that answers that element of the question. In terms of uh, the 42-minute journey time, I, I'm, I'm confused by uh, the premise of his question. I, I don't think there has been a slippage in that. December 18 uh, is when we expected uh, the start date for the introduction of the 42-minute uh, fastest journey time. Uh, and, and, and we're still uh, getting signals from Network Rail uh, and the Scott Rail Alliance that uh, by December uh, of this year that we will have 42-minute uh, journey times being introduced. Uh, I think when Alex Hines was in front of um, the committee, he, he, he reaffirmed that uh, already. We're already delivering on journey time improvements, it should be said. Um, there's some services at the moment on those electric services that are achieving 44 minutes journey times. So, you know, we're not far off 42 minutes. Uh, and as I say, the expectation is that would, that commitment of December 18 is, 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 still, um, is still forthcoming. Uh, in terms of the last question... Uh, his, his, his costs. Uh, I thought I did answer the question in the sense Mr Mason asked me, uh, you know, would the Scottish taxpayer uh, foot the bill for that? And I said, no, Scottish taxpayer uh, wouldn't fit the, foot the bill for that. That's because we've come to an agreement and an arrangement uh, with uh, ScotRail. It is commercially sensitive and commercially confidential. Uh, and, and in that regard, I'm happy to go back to see what is, you know, what, what I can legally say and around that and perhaps write to the convener in the appropriate manner to then share with the rest of the committee. Uh, I do have to be careful, as I say, because it is a commercial uh, arrangement. But the main, uh, the main thing to say for, out of that is that uh, you know the Scottish taxpayer will, will, will not be uh, funding the, the, the significant or the bulk cost of, of, of those three six fives. Uh, it's, it's very, very. You managed to slip three in under the guise of one there. So it's, one it's, more. It's, it's actually, I'd, I'd like to bring in John Finney and then Kate Forbes. It's not really a question, it's a follow-up to the response. With the greatest respect, the Minister didn't really answer my questions. The first question is, when will the 385s be an introduction live on the lines with passengers? Uh, he's welcome to write to us perhaps later, if he doesn't want to go into detail now. Uh, secondly, I'm glad he clarified the December 18 date, because our briefing papers say that the introduction of the 42-minute train times has slipped to 2019, so that's helpful clarification. 
And thirdly, if you could write to the committee with the cost of leasing the 365s, again, I don't think he answered that question either. Thank you. Do you want to come in briefly, Minister? Well, he's, he's right, actually. Of course, the member, I should have uh, mentioned 385s. The, 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 the anticipation is still uh, that uh, they're introduced uh, later in, in summer. Now, the anticipation, of course, is in relation to the windscreen issue. Uh, the update I can give the committee is that two windscreens, uh, you know, or potential uh, solutions to the windscreen problem uh, are fitted to, to, to one train set, one in, on, on the front, one on the rear. Um, one is a uh, a variation of the curved windscreen. Uh, the other windscreen is a flatter windscreen, which will need a kind of flat aperture over the, uh, in order to install it. Now, it will be important that, of course, as left, uh, the train drivers are, are very much involved uh, in the testing of those trains. So that is, uh, is that unit in Scotland now? Or is it on its way? Okay. It was uh, due to come this week. Okay. So it's due, today or tomorrow. That, that, that yeah. train set is due to come this week. Uh, and, and, and drivers, of course, now will be able to, to test and, and see whether or not they are reassured uh, around that if they are reassured uh, and all the other processes that we're working with fall into line and we find a solution it should be said that um you know wh whatever the solution is whether it's the the slightly less curved windscreen or if it's the flatter windscreen that you know uh, the manufacturer and, and scotrail they're ready to press the button on getting them in as soon as possible if all of that falls into line then as i say we'd expect uh, uh, entry into service uh, by late summer of the 385s I'm going to move to John. Uh, John. Okay, it's, it's a brief point for the Minister. Minister, I'm very keen that you sit there and, and answer all questions about Scotland's rail, and I have a slight frustration that because of the answers that you understandably give in relation to network rail, that's not the case. For that reason, Scottish Greens do support devolution of network rail. But I, I want to ask you about <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> beg your pardon, the funding mechanism, because uh, when most recently I was in touch with your officials, this was the decision of the UK government for the forthcoming control plea there to unilaterally change the formula, I was told that, uh, and I hope I've got the figure correct, uh, Convener, that it was 440 million was the shortfall. Are you in a position to give an update on that? Because it would seem to me that um, if that is the correct figure or anything approaching that figure, then there's an opportunity for that to be more constructively invested, ideally in the Highland Main Line. <clears throat> hand we're very happy to take a written answer on that but if you've got it please please disclose 400 million shortfall is the one that I mean, previously was a higher shortfall in fact from the uk uh, government and uh, you know i'm happy to to speak to the member as well offline but he's absolutely right the funding formula changed unilaterally included things for example uh, although the, in, the the integration of btp was is going ahead it still included btp functions uh, you know that uh, that are now being uh, devolved uh, and there was a lot of discussion between myself uh, derek mckay uh, the uh, her majesty's treasury and indeed uh, the uk government's department for transport but we're not at a resolution uh, and i think you know th th there's not much further we can take it in effect scotland has to accept a 400 million shortfall due to a unilateral decision to change the funding formula, and it's not one that I'm happy about at all, and anything I can do, but the members, helpfully uh, supporting that uh, would be, you know, anything I can do further to that, I, I certainly will. It is yours a brief question. Uh, next, it's about Island, uh, main line and the review group, which the minister um, announced recently. What uh, is the Minister's intentions when it comes to the West Highland main line in order to get as much traffic and freight off the A82? Well, I mean, I know the member uh, has been really involved in freight issues around the, the A82, and in fact, it was her own summit which uh, helped us to, to gain and gather some more views uh, from stakeholders, which allowed us to, of course, uh, make the announcement of widening. Uh, the tab at Tin Van Arnhem scheme, which is welcomed by, by stakeholders there. So I know her interest uh, in this issue. Uh, what I would say is I'm really delighted about uh, the West Highland um, Mainline Review Group. Its first meeting, I think, is next week yes, of that. Yes, yes. Uh, next meeting, the first meeting uh, of that group is next week. Uh, I could furnish the member uh, through the committee, of course, as appropriate, uh, with the details of who attended that meeting, the minutes, uh, and so on and so forth of that meeting. I think it will have a transformative, uh, really transformative effect uh, on that line. There are some really key challenges. Um, the journey times, uh, the, the rolling stock, 
timetabling, so on and so forth. But taking a focused look on that, uh, like we are doing, for example, with the Far North uh, line, I think will, will, will make a big, big difference uh, to that line. Uh, and uh, freight is a big part of that too. And she'll know that there's a huge opportunity around timber, for example, as well as other uh, freight goods. And uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at that uh, with great interest. Thank you. This question is Mike Rumbles. <clears throat> um, my question is focused on high-speed trains. So we know that 54 Class 43 high-speed trains, that's the old intercity 125s, will enter service later this year right across Scotland after substantial refurbishment. So my question is this, really. What's the expected lifetime mileage capacity of a Class 43 train, and therefore what's the average mileage of these trains? I don't have the answer to hand, uh, I'm afraid, but again, I could, I could furnish you with that. It should be said that train refurbishment of, of older rolling stock is, is not uncommon, and in fact, many in the rail industry uh, will tell you that uh, when a train is refurbished, and I'm pleased that, that refurbishment, some of that refurbishment work, of course, happening uh, here in Scotland, uh, can be, uh, have the same effect of, of, of new uh, rolling stock. In terms of the exact mileage and so on and so forth, I'm afraid I, I don't have that. Uh, information to hand, but I'd be happy uh, to write to the committee again through the convener as appropriate. I did write a parliamentary question to you, and you three weeks ago, and you said you don't want to hold that information, so I'd expected that you'd have it by now. I mean, at least, what's the life expectancy of these trains? I mean, we're introducing 54 across. Do we not know what the life expectancy of the trains are? Well, yeah, so we have them underwritten, uh, is my understanding, for... Uh, 15 years in terms of the lease. So I expect them to perform their function for 15 years for the lease time that we have them. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that he's disappointed I don't have the uh, mileage capability of HSTs to hand, but uh, you know that is uh, not something routinely uh, that I would have to hand. But I, I will endeavour, if I can get it to him, I will. But I'll speak to, of course, uh, Network Rail and, and the ScotRail Alliance on that and, and try to get him uh, that information where I can. But you know we have these tra we expect them to perform uh, to, the, to, the, to their capability for the time that we have them for the lease. And they will make a transformative difference. This is the first time we will have uh, an intercity high-speed network between uh, Scotland's cities. But, but Scotland are, buying, are leasing this whole fleet of 54 trains. We don't, we, we don't know what the mileage capacity is of these trains. We don't know what their life expectancy is. I find that amazing uh, that, uh, Minister, you... you particularly your officials, haven't told you or haven't been able to tell you what that is, because it's a pretty fundamental question, and I'm surprised that we don't know the answer. It's not. I'll pass over to my real official, uh, Bill, Bill Reeves, but I don't think it is a fundamental issue. Uh, I think the fundamental issue is, will the trains perform to the function that we want them to perform for the period that we have them? The answer to that is unequivocally... Unequivocally, yes. Uh, now, I can pass to my officials who will tell you that, of course, they're being refitted with new engines, new doors, being rebuilt, refurbished, and they will go into the detail. And Bill Reeve can, can do some of that, of course. But my job is to ensure that the trains we're getting are capable of going at the high speeds that they're going at safely, uh, and, and, of course, that they perform for the time that we have them. And the answer to that is absolutely yes, without having to know the exact mileage capability of them. But I'll pass to Bill Reeve and we'll probably go into more well, technical. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't think there is anything um, uh, such as a, a mileage capability for a train. The question is, uh, do you keep it re-engineered? Do you keep it as good as new? These trains have already had new engines fitted recently. Uh, we're putting new power-operated doors on, we're putting control emission toilets. The, uh, it, it'd be worth, if you're interested, going, going to have a look at the extent of the, the re-engineering on these carriages, where they are stripped right down to the metal, all corrosion is taken out, uh, new metal is put in place. Um, uh, and, and from colleagues around the rail industry, uh, there is a widespread appreciation that, that the carriages are about to come and the refit they're getting will make them uh, amongst the most popular in city carriages anywhere in Britain. In fact, um, so, so I, I don't recognise the concept in engineering terms as an engineer of a limited life, a limited mileage for, for a fleet of this well, nature. Let me put it this way, if, if you don't recognise that. I mean, to, to you know, there are people listening to this conversation who will be surprised that, um, I mean, if you were going to buy or lease a car, you would, you would... It's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking about leasing the train, and you can't give me the answers. If the normal person was going to lease a vehicle would want to know 
what the life expectancy of that vehicle is, what the... Yes, they would want to know that. Excuse me. Hold on, sorry. I'd appreciate Can, not sorry, being interrupted Mike, by Mike, the members of the committee. Mike, sorry. I, I'm the convener of this committee, and, and, and I will actually direct the way it goes as far as who answers the question. I would ask for all members to give a certain amount of leeway to other members to ask questions in the same way that other members should, will give them the same leeway. This is Mike's last attempt at this question before we move on to Sir Colin. Could I, let, could I ask members please to let him ask the question and then we'll move on to Colin. Mike. To me, it is a basic... I, I'm a lay person at this. It's a fairly basic question and, and very many people would want to know. We're having 54 trains into service across Scotland. They're old 125 intercities. You're refurbishing them. <laughs> people should know, the public need to know that these will, how, that you've got a, a grasp of this, how long you expect these trains to be running for, what, what's the average, uh, I, I'm trying again, I mean, I've tried a written question, I haven't got the answers two, three weeks ago, I'm trying now, I'm not getting the answers to. I would genuinely like the answer to this. What's the life expectancy of these trains, and can we judge it by the mileage, please? Yes, I've probably talked to thousands of passengers in my time, and I can't recall a single one asking me the mileage capability of a piece of rolling stock. So to say that the public want to know, I think the member is, is slightly out of touch with the public. What they do want to ask me around, what they do want to ask me about is when new rolling stock comes in, will it be capable? Will it be safe? Will it deliver journey time improvements? And the answer to all of those questions is an unequivocal yes. Now, my director here, very, I think very kindly, has offered you to go in to see some of the refurbishment and the train that's taking place. If you have technical questions for the engineers, we, can, we have no problem in, 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 in setting that up for the member, or indeed any members of the committee, or indeed if the entire committee wishes to go in to see the refurbishment of the trains, I'm sure that's something we can arrange and a detailed discussion with the engineers can be had. So as far as we're going to go on that, Colin, yours is the next question. Thanks, Convener, and good morning to the panel. It's been reported that, that the UK government may be about to, to make an announcement on the future of the East Coast mainline, either to, to bring it back under public control or allow it to continue in, in private hands operated by Stagecoach and Virgin Trains. Minister, have you been involved in any discussions with the UK government on the matter, and what is the, the preferred option of the Scottish government? I spoke to the Secretary uh, of State and expressed to him my, my disappointment that uh, he didn't give me advance notice uh, of, of uh, the announcement. Now, in fairness to him, he, he counterclaimed that, of course, uh, he had to tell Parliament uh, first and foremost. But uh, being, uh, you know, the, the impact of, 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 of any change to the East Coast franchise, of course, would be significant on Scotland. So I was disappointed not to receive the advance notice. And uh, in fairness, since then, uh, has, he has committed to, to, to speak to me uh, in advance of any decision or announcement that he makes. So far, I've not had anything from him, and therefore, uh, the member's right. There, there, there is speculation very publicly around uh, the options. Uh, the options are, as he knows, uh, potentially going for a, an operator of last resort uh, type model or indeed uh, running it as a, as a not-for-profit franchise. I have to say I don't have a preference for either in the sense that my main concern is the service. There is no diminution in the service for Scottish passengers. Uh, and indeed, there's not an additional cost to the taxpayer for that. And, uh, you know, my key issue, though, around this, because it is a UK government franchise as opposed to Scottish taxpayers that are affected, is to ensure that there is no diminution in that service. But I am, in some respects, um, agnostic to, to which of the options uh, we, we, we go down. Certainly, uh, there's a case for looking at and examining greater Scottish uh, involvement uh, in that franchise, but again, that's a conversation I would have with the Secretary of State. But, but Minister, when this franchise was publicly run, it, it delivered a billion pounds to the UK Treasury, it had a uh, record passenger satisfaction, it kept fares down, it engaged the workforce in private hands, it's failed not once but three times. Surely the Scottish Government have a view on keeping this franchise away from the failed model run by Stagecoach and Virgin that's failing to deliver for passengers here in Scotland. Mm. Surely you have a view that it should be under public ownership. Uh, see, I think the, the ownership question, and I respect that he and I have a difference in this, but I think the, publish, uh, the, the, the ownership uh, 
question is frankly a, a bit of a red herring. There are, of course, public franchises that may well cost money in real terms, and there are uh, private companies that will deliver. So in stagecoaches, uh, in, in, in this current uh, East Coast franchise, uh, my understanding is, although they didn't deliver the premium that they promised to do so, uh, they have still delivered, uh, uh, of course, uh, premiums uh, to, the, to, to the Treasury. Uh, and it's not a case of costing the taxpayer. Uh, now, I can double check on, on, on that and the, and the money involved in that. But as I say, for me, uh, if there is a better model to run this through you know, OLR, then that absolutely is an option that should be on the table, should be explored, and not one that I would discount. My point is, from my perspective, because it's not Scottish taxpayers' money that's involved in this, uh, really the, the, the concern for me is making sure that there's no diminution in the service. Now, I should also say to the member, it's worth noting that it is our government that is bringing forward the proposal for a public sector real bid. In fact, we are putting together that public sector uh, real bid and, and his party, although it was his predecessor, have been involved in those discussions, as have the trade unions. I would respectfully say that no other political party has ever allowed for a public sector bidder to bid for Scottish rail contracts. Uh, we are the first to bring that forward, something I'm very proud of. But you acknowledge that publicly, a public bid is not the same as public ownership. Why is it you're so opposed to public ownership of our railways? I think if you speak to people that are involved in uh, British Rail, for example, uh, they will tell you that uh, it was not necessarily the always the nostalgic view of the railways that perhaps Colin Smith and, and other members that believe in wholesale renationalisation have. So I'm not saying that I'm against that. Hence, why you know we have uh, uh, we have committed to bring forward a public sector rail bid. We think that it should compete with private entities uh, as well. So uh, private model can work. The public model absolutely can work. Uh, as well, uh, but therefore I think it's important for them uh, to compete in that space. Uh, Jamie, you. Uh, thank you, convener, and I know we have lots of other subjects uh, to go on to, so before we move off of rail, uh, last week in committee, Alex Hines said the following, in this five-year control period, which Network Rail is regulated by, we are due to underspend in Scotland. This is in part a result of the fact that the investment programme is on time and on budget. Given what we've talked about today in terms of delivery of projects and the increasing cost of projects, does the Minister agree with that statement? What is the value of this underspend and what happens to the surplus cash? Again, I can write to the, the member with a bit more detail on the, on the specifics, but if you remember my uh, opening uh, uh, answer to the question on Egypt, I did say some projects had reduced in cost. The Highland Mainline would be an example of that with tens of millions of pounds. Uh, reduction in, in, in the projected cost of the Highland Mainline improvements. So there have been some pro programmes where there's been an increase and there's some programmes and uh, projects where there's been a decrease. And so I also said the, the, the reassurance for committee is that it's coming within the financial envelope for control period five. Now, what can be done in that period uh, is, is, is a number of enhancements and improvements. And we can look to accelerate those because uh, we know the rough level. We don't know the absolute level because we haven't had the final cost as I already have mentioned to committee, but once uh, you know we have a, an idea of what the anticipated cost may be, we can uh, we, we we can move forward with a, a whole range of potential enhancements, which we're already uh, doing. But uh, for the for the purpose of brevity, uh, if the committee would like more detail on that, and the member would like more detail on that, I can furnish them with that. Do, do you know how much Scotrail have underspent by in this five-year control period? Well, it's network. it's network rail first of all, uh, not Scotrail rail uh, that underspend. But secondly, it's worth saying. This goes back to the question of anticipated final cost versus final cost. So uh, until I get the final cost, uh, I would reserve judgment in saying this is the exact number of millions uh, that have been uh, underspent. Once I get the final costs, then of course the committee, first of all, will be the first to know because I've committed to do that. And secondly, uh, attached to that, we can let you know then how much is left within uh, the spending for control period five. A very brief one before we move on to John yeah. Finney. A very brief one and, and a, a short answer, I'm sure. It's just when the 125s do finally come onto the Aberdeen uh, Edinburgh line, what can we expect as, as far as travel times are concerned? Are they coming down significantly or what? Yeah. So we are committed to a 10 minute reduction in journey time, and that is still uh, the plan, it is dependent on other enhancements. Uh, and improvements, but we are looking for a reduction in journey time of around about 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, John Finney, yours is the next set of questions. 
Now, uh, morning, Minister. Morning, panel. Uh, I have a series of questions, Minister, about Highlands and Islands Airport Limited, and uh, you have uh, Scottish ministers own that, and it's about proposals they have about air traffic control. Now, um, I've met Prospect the Union, who represent air traffic controllers. I've also met representatives of Cornyn and Shah, the Western Isles Council, who indeed have written the committee. And I'd like to quote to you, uh, I think, as an opening from uh, something that <coughs> Prospect have said, Prospect the Union, and that is, and I quote, Prospect supports High Isles need to modernise its infrastructure to keep up pace uh, uh, with regulations, and that this will require significant investment. However, any centralised monitoring system will be dependent on a reliable, resilient and secure communications infrastructure between the mainland and the islands, which simply does not exist. Hyal are gambling on this, and Prospect uh, believes that this is gambling with people's safety. That's quite a, a damning indictment. What do you have to say about that, Minister? Well, a couple of things. First, the engagement with Prospect is absolutely vital. So Hyal are engaging with Prospect. I think they've got a further meeting in June and then another one in July. Um, I think they're going to invite them as, as, as part of a uh, you know, key stakeholder in terms of taking this proposal uh, forward, so that's to be welcomed. I, I'm also due to meet with Prospect, I think, next month or later this month. Uh, I'll get the date uh, to the member, so I'm keen to hear from air traffic controllers uh, themselves. The second thing to say in all of this is that safety will never be compromised. Uh, that is my number one priority in this job, uh, is the direction uh, of, uh, that I've given to Hyle is the high boards number one but even if you didn't uh, believe uh, that it was our priority of course a change of this scale would have to go through the would have to go through the regulator the CAA uh, who would have to also have to be very uh, convinced of the, of the safety case uh, for this and this proposal is actually to enhance safety if I can just give the member a couple of examples with the exception of Inverness Controllers at Hyle Airport can't currently see planes at night. Now, not every member knows that, but they can't currently see planes at night. But the new surveillance system will mean that controllers can see the aircraft at all times. At present, for example, wildlife, which includes obviously birds, uh, which may cause damage to aircraft, they can only be detected visually. Bear in mind what I've just said. The new system will have infrared sensors, which will make detecting wildlife easier. So I think that's important to stress that these proposals and projects be taken forward to enhance safety as well as the issues around recruitment. We are prospect are, are absolutely right to raise concern, and other members have raised concern with me on this, is in around the communications infrastructure, the digital infrastructure needed for uh, remote to air traffic control. It's worth saying that this proposal is a 10 to 15 year proposal. We'd be absolutely confident that we'd have the communication and digital infrastructure in place within that time frame. But what would also be built, and even if we had all the communication infrastructure in place, there's no way that the CAA would sign this off without a number of backups or you know, levels of redundancy within the system. That if something failed, what would be the next level of redundancy? And then if that failed, and then if that failed. So there would be, you know, from talking to Hyle, six or seven levels of redundancy built into the system. So I hope that gives the member some element of reassurance. And what I would say on, on, on the air traffic control proposal, if members would find it, useful, I'm sure I could ask Hayal to come in and give a kind of technical briefing uh, to the committee because it may well help to, 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 to uh, reassure them around some of the concerns they have. Well, I thank you for that uh, uh, response, Minister, and, and everyone wants um, safety and I don't think there's any suggestion from any quarter that that's not important and I'm sure whilst you're talking about the enhancements that that proposed system would bring, you're not suggesting the existing system is anything short of, no. Um, but you're also the Islands Minister, and I wonder, should High Isle, with its social responsibility, these are lifeline services, should they be considering long-term costs in their budget when reaching this decision, or should they also be considering the impact on staff and communities? I mean, that's a, that's a, a tight balance, I acknowledge, but could you comment on that? And if this is so important, and I don't think anyone doubts that it is, why has there been no public consultation undertaken by Hyal? Surely that's a significant gap. A couple of things to say. Um, he's absolutely right that the impact, the socio-economic impact of Hyal's proposals must be taken into account. 
and that is something they're actively engaging with Highlands and Islands Enterprise as well as the local authorities because these are high skilled jobs and if they are no longer on the island that clearly has an impact I mean two to three to four to five highly skilled highly paid jobs no longer being on an island uh, can have a, a, an imp well, will have an impact so therefore excuse me that is very much part of the conversation that's being had the second point I would make is that this is absolutely about the sustainability of air services in Scotland and to our islands the member will not be probably surprised to hear that there is huge competition for air traffic controls and they can be paid six figure sums f tax free in the f Middle East or the Far East in some cases for, for, for their services and therefore retaining them on the islands and uh, looking at the future and the projection of air traffic controllers that we can put in training programmes and skill programmes and we should do that but retaining them here in Scotland is going to be a huge challenge if we're not willing and we're not able to, as we're not, to pay them the lucrative sums that they get in, for example, uh, the Middle East. And because of this retention issue, it's worth mentioning to committee, and they'll be aware of this, I'm sure some members, that, for example, Stornoway Airport had to close for a period of time because of the issues they were having around retention of stair, uh, air traffic controls. So this proposal is very much about Enhancing the safety is right, the current system absolutely is safe, but enhancing the safety, but also ensuring that the sustainability of our air services is, is key. In terms of the consultation, uh, I'll pass to Gary Cox, who's an aviation official here, but they, they, there's a number of engagement processes that HIL are going through, and it is a 10 year programme. And I think having conversations with the local authority and the unions is probably the right place to start with some of this. But, Gary, do you want to add? To it? Gary, I think, John, you've got another follow-up question. Maybe we could launch that now. Maybe Gary could come in because there's a couple of follows, follow up as well. I'm clearly supportive of the proposal. Do, do, do you have a view formed where um, that centre should be, if that's the direction of travel that's going to go? And the issues of not only recruitment but retention, and um, yes, that, that was made clear to me uh, by Prospect, Surely that we should be redoubling our efforts to keep individuals rather than trying to always find a technical uh, solution. I agree with him, but uh, okay. would any of us be in a different position if we were all being offered double our salary, tax-free, and another, you know, and, 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 and sunnier climates? Uh, you know, it, it, is, it is difficult. There is only so much we can do without an astronomical cost. I mean, the islands are a, are, a, are a beautiful place to live and work, and that is why many of the air traffic controllers choose to base themselves on our islands, because they love the lifestyle, they love our islands, and so on and so forth. But there is undoubtedly, at the major hub airports of the world, a real challenge, uh, and, and, and the expansion of air services only means that that challenge is going to become even more acute. Uh, so, so w with respect, he's, he, he is right. I mean, we should do what we can to, to retain air traffic controllers. Doing that wherever the remote tower is located will in itself be a challenge. That won't be easy. Uh, in terms of my own view on where the remote traffic, uh, the air, air traffic uh, control centre should be, I, I don't have a view on that. There is uh, a process underway at the moment with involving independent uh, consultants, which I uh, have engaged with, to, to look at a number of issues, staffing issues, uh, wider location issues, including transport, public transport issues, connections with road and rail, um, housing, availability of housing, uh, technology, digital connectivity, the economic social impacts, um, feedback from staff and stakeholders will also be essential to that as well. So I don't have a view. Uh, my understanding is that the independent report uh, on, on the location of that should be available in around uh, the summer, late summer, uh, autumn time. But uh, uh, again, that is a piece of work that Hale are taking forward. But Gary, do you want to come in to add any? Yeah, no, I think that... that I think that pretty much covers it. There's just a couple of points to, to add. I think in terms of the public consultation and you know, consultation engagement with airlines, other airport customers, um, and, and, and local authorities, I think you know, are very, very clear that this is not just a technical project. It's very much a, you know, hearts and minds, and, and there's a lot of work to do to, to take people with them on this 10, 15 year journey. Um, so they, they are very, very clear that you know, community engagement, consultation with local authorities is a key part to, to successful delivery of this, this entire project. I think just to add in, in to the point that the Minister made about um, you know, air traffic controllers, what we're beginning to see um, from controllers around the Heil network who have been out to see this technology um, operating in Sweden uh, and doing it in Nats and in, in Swanwick 
they are coming back, in many cases, hugely enthusiastic about the opportunities this technology brings. Um, and you know, they can see this as being you know, you know, essential for the future of air traffic control. It may well be ultimately when Heil have this up and running in 10 to 15 years' time that you know, Heil becomes a centre of expertise. It be could become a training um, organisation for people coming into the industry adopting this, this latest technology. Um, so we're seeing that you know, once controllers um, are actually experiencing this new stuff and its capabilities, they're actually coming back quite enthusiastic uh, about it. I think in terms of the location um, of the, um, the, the, the digital centre, um, clearly Heil are, are, are conscious that, that staff um, need, need that clarity. Um, and they are very, very keen to, to progress that and make a, uh, make a decision um, so that staff uh, around the network um, have, as much, um, you know, have as much notice as possible. You know, they don't want to leave this until later on in the, the programme. You wanted to come in briefly and then go, Ross. I have a couple of questions which are related. Uh, first of all, we have four airports with no air traffic controllers, only information service provided. And I, j I just wonder if any thought has been given to improve the provision there, in particular uh, getting licensed uh, precision GPS approaches, which the UK, I think at the moment, only has a single airfield where that's the case. Now, I'm not certain, but I think it might be Biggin Hill. Are we, are, is that being looked at? And similarly, at the stations where there is an air traffic controller that are affected by this, is consideration being given to retaining an uh, air flight information service officer at these stations so that if the central system is unavailable, it's still possible for that local uh, person to provide a, 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 non -procedural, a procedural non-precision approach uh, and thus keep the op airport open, provided the weather would permit that. Minister. Well, I might pass to Gary for some of the technical, but uh, it should be said that uh, Hayal made it clear that Barra, Tyree, Isla and Campbelltown will not be affected uh, by uh, these because of different levels of air traffic usage, so not all airports. Uh, are being affected by the proposals taken forward. Uh, again, I think probably uh, Mr Stevenson, if nobody else, would find a one-to-one -a -one conversation with Hayal around the technical detail on this probably if, quite helpful. But if, Gary, if I may, Minister, before you pass over, I really was asking the point, which is possibly one for you rather than for Mr Cox, at those four airports, whether we're looking at opportunities to improve the service there by GPS use, which in particular would enable those airports to be used in poorer weather than they currently are. Well, again, because that's a policy yeah. issue. Well, where improvements can be made, then, and, and they're suggested by HIAL, uh, you know, I will look at those always open minded. I'm always uh, bound by the budgetary constraints that I have, uh, and that would have to be taken into consideration. But it is important to emphasise, and, and I just wish to do this again on the record, that the current, uh, of course, uh, approach is taken at Hyle Airports is safe, and people's safety is absolutely ensured. This is just about enhancing that, and GPS technology is not one that I've discounted at all. I'm happy to bring you in, but I, I would ask if you could answer it briefly, because I've got another question on, uh, on this particular no, subject. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm always nervous with Mr Stevenson's great expertise in aviation issues. But, um, yeah, I think that the FISO point in terms of backup, that, that's very interesting. We'll feed that back to, to, to Hyle. It may well be that the retention of a FISO at some of these airports is one of the levels of resilience that the Minister spoke about, so we're, we're happy to pick that up. Thank you. Uh, Kel Ross. Thank you, Mina. Um Good morning, panel. Minister, I think that um, certainly from uh, my point of view and certainly from the island's point of view as well, there's a lot of criteria that's going to go into where this is actually going to be cited, and you mentioned a lot of it just now. If it's a 10 to 15 year project, I think the worry is that the criteria you mentioned point to one place that it could possibly go, and I'm not going to predetermine that decision. Whereas in 10 to 15 years' time, the infrastructure in other areas will have improved so that a decision that is correct just now may not be a decision that's correct in 10 to 15 years' time if it's such a long project. Um, and I also wanted to touch on the public consultation aspect as well. Um, I don't know any regular passengers that have been consulted about this. Um, and I would quite like um, perhaps the Minister or on behalf of HIAL to um, find out just who exactly has been consulted in terms of chambers of commerce, businesses, and as you said, um, members of the public that use the airports regularly. 
Minister. I, mean, I think the point that Gail Ross makes is, is a fair one in relation to connectivity and, and a 10 to 15 year plan. But I think equally, uh, Gary's point in our conversations with the unions has been that they want as much notice of where this, uh, this location uh, of the uh, remote air traffic control centre could be. And I think the certainty for the staff is hugely important, knowing um, myself how long from inception to completion road projects can take because of the various statutory process you have to go through, potential for objections, public local inquiries, all that kind of thing. Uh, yes, some things can change within 10 years, but dramatically uh, what is due to change in 10 years is, is, is probably uh, somewhat unlikely or I would have been cited on, on, on that. So we already know about the major you know, for example, the dueling projects on A9 and A96 and everything else that's going on. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's not a point that's lost on us, so I think it's something to reflect on. Again, we can get you the detail on, on consultation, but in my answer to John Finney, I mentioned that it was appropriate, I think, and absolutely right, that first of all, the unions are the ones, and, and, and the, you know, the air traffic controls are the ones that are consulted with, and the local authorities uh, as well. And there's been a, a quite a, a level of engagement from the board and indeed the chief executive uh, with them from, from stakeholder forums like Convention of the Highlands and Islands right the way through to one-to-one -one conversations uh, with, with uh, uh, stakeholders. Uh, wider public consultation uh, I think will come thereafter, but again, we can furnish you with some of the detail on that. Um, John, if you've got a very short question. It's, it's, it's much a comment, and it's to, to thank the Minister and the official for, for the response and to say, taking some reassurance from it, and I think it's good that Prospect are involved, that, that on the project board, it's just to ask that you'll keep a, a close watch on this, because Hyal's experience, also in relation to the <coughs> levying of car parking charges, um, they need to improve their community engagement, Minister, and I'd be appreciative if you would keep an eye on that, please. Yes, I, I will. I can't promise the member that I'll still be the Minister for Transport and Islands in 10 years once this comes through its uh, fruition. I, would, I certainly hope so. More next week, I would certainly <laughs> hope so. But uh, as you know, Transport Minister is only as good as his, as his winter. Now, is, now. So, um, I, I think uh, I, will, I will keep a close eye, of course, for the time that I'm, I'm in this portfolio. Uh, because he's absolutely right. The, the, the purpose of my job is to be the island's man within the government. And therefore, the impact on the islands this may have that might be somewhat negative in relation to the, the, the loss of high skilled jobs. My you know, assurance is to make sure that the positives are accentuated, that is the sustainability of air services to our island. So yes, I will keep a close eye on it and I'm happy to even report back to the member if he wishes on the conversations I have with Prospect because he clearly uh, has a good engagement with the union. Okay, many thanks indeed. Thank you. Uh, Kate Forbes. Great, thank you very much. I've got a question on community transport, which is obviously quite uh, important where there are no commercial or local authority subsidised services. Um, and the first question I have is, is quite a technical one, which may or may not be answerable, and it's also about a reserved matter. There have been a number of community transport operating groups that have approached me with concern about whether they will still be eligible for a section 19 permit to continue operating. Now, I, I appreciate, I think that's a reserved issue, but I wonder if um, the minister has had any involvement with the UK government's intentions around that. Uh, I have, and I know well about the section 19 and section 22 permits and, and, and the proposal for alterations of the guidelines around that. Uh, the, the UK government uh, members, right, of course, as a reserve matter. I've written to the UK government on uh, my reservations around the proposals that they have. Uh, perhaps, again, the easiest thing to do, I don't think there would be an issue with this, would be just be to provide the convener uh, with the copy of a letter I sent to the UK government highlighting some of my concerns on the Section 19 and 22 proposals. In fairness to the UK government, from the conversations I've had, they're not unaware of that. And, and the, uh, my understanding, uh, if I remember correctly, is they put some funding uh, forward in order to, to try to, to give some reassurances to community transport that might be impacted by their proposed changes. So uh, anyway, the, the easiest thing probably to do in this would be to give you my letter that I uh, submitted to the UK government on their consultation. Thank you very much. Now, I don't believe there's any statutory requirement for local authorities or government to uh, support financially um, community transport groups, but in 2013, the Scottish Government announced a one-off £1 million scheme for new or replacement community transport vehicles. Has the Scottish Government got any um, plans currently for either repeating that scheme or other ways of supporting community transport operators, which, as I say, are filling gaps left by local authorities? Yeah, and I really uh, thank all those 
uh, who have been involved in community transport over the years because there's no doubt at all, particularly in remote and rural areas, the saving to the public purse because of the work that they do is, is, is probably immeasurable. So I have a good relationship with the Community Transport Association. We fund, of course, the Community Transport Association uh, and, and I'm very, very pleased to, to, to do that. So there is some support in relation to the Community Transport Association, the direct funding we give them. We also work with them to find out where the challenges are and where can we best help. So when the Community Transport Association came to me uh, you know, early, very early on when I was appointed, um, it was clear that there was an issue around D1 licences, which is a minibus driving licences, and the cost being prohibitive. Uh, so uh, we funded a scheme to help with the cost of D1 licences. So where we can be supportive and helpful uh, in relation to community transport, we absolutely will. In terms of the, the as she described it, the, the, the one-off £1 million payment in 2013, uh, uh, I suppose the clue somewhat is in the name. It's a one-off payment. Uh, we, you know, it's not a regular payment that we've made. Uh, you know, I have budgetary constraints at the moment, so it's not in my plans to, to have another further uh, uh, one million pound payment uh, as we did in 2013 for re replacement vehicles. My hope is that the 2013 vehicles that were purchased, you know, the time frame, kind of four or five years onwards. They shouldn't need replacing uh, quite at this stage, um, though, I, though I appreciate other vehicles may well be. But uh, no, it's not my plans at the moment, but we are providing other support. Great. One more. Um, in terms of the National Concessionary Travel Scheme, does that apply to community transport services? And based on the first answer, are there any plans on um, extending it? So I, I get asked this on in, in, in a regular occasion when I go to the, the, the CTA conference. It's probably one of the, the, the number one issues around this. And, and I, well, I, I absolutely appreciate that it's a big issue. There are some difficulties with extending across all modes of community transport. So community transport can, the scheme it does, does include, the concessionary scheme does include uh, community bus services that are also local uh, bus services that are available to the general public. Um, so, so there are a number of... Uh, so, so there are a number of community transport uh, links that are funded or do get national concessionary travel, but the, the stipulation is they have to also be open to, to kind of general public as well. The difficulty with extending it further to that is, is it, there's a number of difficulties, but just to give you one, uh, for example, um, you know, a roughly, if I remember correctly, the number two thirds of vehicles used by community transport are cars. So therefore, you can imagine the difficulty in expanding the national concessionary scheme to, to cars and, 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 the, and, and the drivers of cars, and that's two thirds. Um, so uh, there's that. There probably is, frankly, the cost element too. Um, having engaged with Age Scotland, uh, who have who regularly engaged on the concessionary travel scheme issue uh, with us, community transport. If we if we included all community transport within that, you're talking about an eleven point. Two million pounds increase in 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 in, in the budget, uh, and that's just not sustainable. Considering at the moment, uh, the trajectory of of uh, uh, of older people that would fall within the scheme over the next ten to twenty years, we're already looking at sustainability challenges that we've talked about at this committee. Uh, that would only add to that pressure. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. The next question, Jamie Green. Uh, hold on, I missed somebody out. No, Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'd like to talk about ferries, uh, Minister. Um, people in the Highlands and Islands have suffered a... Apologies. Okay. Uh, I would say a catalogue of issues uh, with regards to the CalMac ferries. Uh, as you are aware, there have been complications to repairs of major vessels and a lack of available alternatives. Uh, some of these changes have included single vessel timetables and delays to uh, summer services as well. Um, the Minister is quite keen, often and publicly, to criticise ScotRail when things go wrong. Is he confident that CalMac is currently delivering for our island communities, and is the current fleet fit for purpose? Uh, look, I've also been disappointed in the start to the summer season. Um, but some of this, of course, uh, is, is, is unforeseen. Uh, the issues around the Klansmen in terms of the propulsion system and also the tail shaft. <coughs> Uh, it would be, of course, absolutely unsafe for the Klansmen to be into service, and that is uh, understandable, I think, by, by, by most people. Therefore, um, when one vessel is, is having to go into dry dock or an even extended dry dock and maintenance, uh, therefore we have to, or CalMac has to move around vessels across the network in order to ensure that lifeline services are protected. That is the priority within the contract around lifeline services. When it comes to additional capacity, which I think is an absolutely fair question, 
When it comes to additional capacity, there's a couple of things that we can do. One is, of course, clearly build more vessels when that is happening. And the member, I think, is very aware of uh, the two vessels being built at Ferguson's. Uh, and above and beyond that, we've built uh, eight vessels since uh, we've been in power for the last uh, 11 years in, in, in government. So a number of vessels have been built. A number of vessels will be built. Frankly, we need to, excuse me, even once ATO 1 or Glen Sanix and ATO 2 are complete, we have to continue to build more vessels. We've committed to the next vessel being for the Isla route, which, uh, again, the member probably is aware is hugely popular because of uh, whisky tourism uh, specifically. The second thing we can try to do is, is, is find on the open market some additional tonnage of vessels. That is, has been tried uh, for the, certainly the, 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 the two summers that I've been uh, transport minister. The direction has gone out to our colleagues at CMAL to, to look for additional tonnage. Uh, that comes either at a huge cost um, or indeed the vessels that are on the open market are scarce because you know there's not a lot of vessels in summertime uh, generally around. Or there's issues because people don't want to give them for short-term lease. Or indeed there's issues because, uh, as again the member will probably be aware, they might not fit into various uh, ports and harbours that we have because you know all the ports and harbours are not uh, standardised across uh, the network as well. So um, you know they, they, there are things that are absolutely out, out with CalMax control. That is with the, that which is within CalMax control, uh, and, and the area that I've been disappointed in, I have to say, and, and CalMax know this is is the engagement with communities when something does go wrong. This idea, and I think everybody that I've met and talked to in an island community or that represents an island community, they tell me that they understand and completely understand that vessels can break down, can need extended repair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what they're unhappy about uh, is the communication or the lack thereof of communication, which is something that I think CalMac have to address, and, and I've told them that in no uncertain terms. So, uh, I, mean, I mean, based on that response, so it sounds like quite a perilous situation we're in, in in that respect, because we have a, a fleet of vessels which could go offline at any moment uh, due to, as we've seen, uh, unforeseen technical issues. Uh, there's very little capacity within the CalMac fleet at the moment to uh, meet the requirements of lifeline services. And it sounds like there's very little available in the open market in terms of short-term replacement vessels. So again, I ask the question, is the minister, uh, notwithstanding the fact there are vessels coming down the line at some point in the future, is he confident that the current fleet is fit for purpose and will deliver for Ireland's? Uh, yes, I, I am. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be issues. The, the, the older a vessel is, uh, the longer uh, potentially it will have to spend in dry docking. Uh, and, and, and that is, again, understandable. But yes, the current fleet uh, is capable of delivering uh, for, for our island communities. It should be said that, of course, Glenn Sanix in 802, uh, he knows that uh, once they come on to the fleet, uh, they should make a significant difference, uh, an additional two vessels, and Glenn Sanix will be the first of those uh, to come on, and he, and he knows the, the kind of revised timetable uh, for that. So once that comes online, uh, but that shouldn't stop us from every year looking at the potential there might be for additional tonnage. Um, so yes, the, the current fleet to answer this question directly for, for purpose, uh, but clearly the more vessels we have and the newer vessels we have uh, in the fleet, uh, then the better for the resilience of that fleet. I'll bring you back in after Kate. Um, obviously, the, the uh, building of the new vessels is, is fantastic and can't come soon enough. In terms of the uh, vessel deployment plans for how vessels are going to be moved between routes, uh, is the Minister confident that currently CalMac are uh, engaging with communities to recognise what the current demand is and future demand with a view to when there is additional capacity ensuring that vessels are deployed um, in ways that actually meet demand? Uh, yes, uh, I, I am. But uh, clearly, uh, for members that, and I know, that, of course, the member has uh, islands in her constituency, that if she feels and her stakeholders feel that that engagement uh, is not uh, is not good enough, then uh, one, of course, she should feed that back to Calmac. I know she has regular engagement with uh, the interim uh, chief executive uh, director, uh, Robbie Drummond. So she's right to do that. Uh, but clearly, if any member came to me to say that their island communities were feeling that the engagement was not at a good enough level, uh, then, of course, uh, I can uh, uh, speak to Calmac and ensure that that is, is better. What has made it better is, um, first of all, having a director for communities and then also a community board and the individuals in the community board. In fact, there's some stakeholders from our constituency uh, on that community board 
uh, they are going to make a big, big difference to ensure that the community's voices are very much heard within the governance structure uh, of, 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 of CalMAC. Um, it is tricky because the communities rightly are experiencing a fantastic boom, and that's coming in part, in a large part, for the introduction of RET. Um, so the growth in our islands and the capacity issues are even more acute because of that. Um, and, and, and there are competing demands. So we've announced, for example, the next vessel to be built after 801, 802 will be the Isla vessel. Um, now, there will be some communities that thought their community should have been first. Uh, you know, the member's nodding ahead, and I've got no doubt there's some in our constituency. And when I announce the next vessel after the Isla vessel, I've got no doubt at all that other communities will think that they should have been next in line. What I've got to do is weigh up all of those priorities as best I can uh, and make a judgment which is inevitably going to make some people unhappy, but some people happy. But, uh, you know, I think for, for if I take my Lake Armadale as an example, great engagement with the stakeholders there. They have a real understanding that there's not an overnight solution, but what they want to see is incremental improvements over the next five years and certainly a new vessel undoubtedly in the long term is part of a solution and as I say we're going to have to continue to build vessels uh, as the years go on in order to make sure the resilience of the fleet is better. Thank you. To Jamie and could I, could I ask members because there are a few questions to get through yet to try and uh, keep the questions as short as possible so the Minister can uh, respond appropriately. Thank you, Convener. Uh, in your previous answer uh, to me, Minister, on the new Sanox and 802 ferries, you said that I would be aware of the revised timetable. But in the Chamber last week, you said the timetable to which we previously publicly committed is still the timetable that we have. You also used the words complexities with regards to the new workforce and the fact you were keeping your eye on developments. They don't sound like overly positive words. What are these complexities and developments? And when do you anticipate these two ferries to be in service? Winter 1819 was the revised timetable. Uh, you remember that, of course, it was due to be uh, in, in place in, in, in kind of late summer, uh, autumn of, of this year. So the revised timetable, which I updated uh, Parliament about, was uh, and, and, and continues to be that winter 1819. My answer is no different to the one that I gave in the <coughs> chamber last week. They, there are complexities at Ferguson. I think the member may have visited Ferguson's, if not, uh, having spoken to the owners of Ferguson's, they're very, very open-minded to uh, MSPs, MPs coming to the yard to see for themselves uh, the work that they have done. But uh, yes, there is a new workforce. Uh, the investment that has gone into the yard is into the millions. Uh, so, you know, the, the, and the complexities of the vessels, the first LNG vessels, um, to be built in, in a UK shipyard mean that there are complexities that no other yard or workforce would have had to deal with uh, previously. I just put that on the table because uh, you know it's important to recognise those. There is a wider, of course, objective. We want the delivery of these vessels, of course, and we want them as timidly as, as, as possible. What we also want to do is secure shipbuilding, commercial shipbuilding on the Clyde as best we possibly can. Uh, and we want to secure jobs as well as the yard. So, you know, these are three major objectives, the vessels, the jobs and the yard that we have to look at. And, and we have regular engagement with Ferguson's. But any update on that time uh, scale, if there is any change, if there is any further revision to that, then again, uh, I, I would be uh, coming to Parliament with that. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, these are probably just fairly brief questions on uh, uh, Rosyth Zebruga. Uh, but before asking them, I, I, I note that... Uh, the 1998 Scotland Act at Schedule 5 E3 Marine Transport says, as a reserve matter, financial assistance for sharing service, shipping services which start or finish or both outside Scotland. Given that constraint, uh, what uh, has the government been able to do working with DFDS uh, with a view of uh, re retaining, restarting the size of Brugge service or what other companies uh, has the, company, the government been working with? So to try to be as brief as possible, I'm really disappointed with the announcement from DFDS. And I engaged with DFDS and the chief executive uh, of, of, of the company, or the European head, I should say, of, of, of DFDS uh, on this issue. It would be fair to say that you know, he was, uh, although apologetic to get at this position, you know, simply saying that it was unsustainable, particularly with the fire that took place uh, on the vessel, which would now be out of service for months. Uh, we've given a, we've also spoken to Fourth Ports. Fourth Ports, I have to say, were very upbeat. They think that there's other routes that can be explored, and I'll continue those conversations uh, with Fourth Ports. In terms of financial, uh, we have supported this route. 
uh, to the tune of many millions of pounds uh, over over the years, and, and indeed previous uh, Scottish administrations have done so. Uh, two, uh, we are restricted by what we can do in terms of that particular route because of state aid rules and de minimis funding and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, clearly, whatever we can do to get uh, further routes and exploit further routes between Scotland and the European uh, continent, uh, then we will do. And we have a number of f grants that could potentially help with that. The Waterborne uh, Freight Grant, for example, being just one of those. Uh, the next question is Richard Lau. Yes. Um, can I ask you, basically, I'd like to ask you about electric vehicle purchase scheme. Now, we want to phase out diesel petrol cars by 2032, 14 years from now. Um, electric purchase scheme is an interest-free electric scheme loan administrated by the Energy Savings Trust and funded by Transport Scotland. Can I ask you how many people have benefited up to, benefited up to now on this scheme? Uh, yes, I do have that figure because I remember reading it in my brief uh, last night. Uh, yes, as of May... As of the 15th uh, of May, 505 uh, electric vehicles have been supported through the Low Carbon Transport uh, Loan Scheme. Uh, it has had some oversubscription uh, in, 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 uh, in the last year. Um, uh, in 17, 18, a total of 497 applications with a total value, <coughs> excuse me, of 15 million were received against the budget, which is, which is 8 million. Um, so, you know, a number uh, of, uh, of, well, quite a bit of oversubscription, which to me shows the popularity of the scheme. Um, and therefore, of course, the member will be very aware of the programme for government uh, announcements that we've made in terms of the uh, uptake and the expansion of the uptake of electric vehicles. So we're cons considering how to further expand that scheme. You've just anticipated my next two questions. But basically, along the lines that uh, Mr. Mr Green was going on, I've previously asked you about... Um, chasing up housing associations and, and housing, encouraging the housing minister through the building programme to encourage builders to now install charging points as they have done with solar panels and telephone connections and Wi-Fi or whatever in the, in the past. Um, so where are we with this? So myself and the housing minister have a regular conversation in, in this regard and, uh, you know, I... Uh, I know he is exploring, without putting words in his mouth, the possibility of what could be brought forward legally uh, around planning legislation uh, when it comes to, to, to developments, not just housing developments, but also commercial developments, of course, making sure they have the appropriate uh, cabling infrastructure to allow for electric vehicle charging points. I should say on, 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 on the flip side of that, without having that legislation in place, I've been really pleased to see a number of commercial operators already commit that every house that they build now from now on will have that in place. So, um, yeah, legislation, I still think, is uh, we should explore that, and, and Kevin Stewart is, is doing that and uh, taking that forward. Uh, but I'm pleased to say that even in, in lieu of appropriate legislation, uh, there, are, uh, there are already commercial developers who are taking this forward. Lastly, um, you're saying that uh, £15 million pound would really be needed. You only, you only had eight. Um, so what are you pressing for in the next budget, which is a wee bit away, but... Um, <laughs> You know, if we want to really, you know, encourage people to move off a diesel uh, petrol cars to electric cars, we've got to provide some incentive. So what are you doing to provide that incentive? I suppose in some respects I would say watch this space. Uh, there's a few things. Uh, I don't actually have to wait till the next budget in that uh, you know, we're, we're able to, to take forward some of these programme for government initiatives uh, within the budget that we, that we currently have. But I would expect uh, in, in, in the not-too-distant future... Uh, to be able to to make announcements around that particular loan scheme, which will, you know, be extended and expanded where, where I can. <laughs> I'm delighted uh, that uh, that Dick Lyle is doing his part for decarbonising transport, but also we, there's also two or three other measures which I'm looking at, which are above and beyond the loan scheme. Which again, if I can just put it in the the, the if I can just say watch this space because uh, we will be making those announcements uh, uh, in the in the near future. Thank you. Briefly, John, and then I'm going to go on to John Finney. So I would ask brief, brief answers to these questions. Thanks, Convener. I think I saw that in Perth there's a plans to introduce a filling station which would supply both electricity and hydrogen. I just wonder, is the government still open to hydrogen cars as well as electric cars? Yes, without doubt, we're technology neutral. Uh, the market will dictate which way this uh, tends to go. Uh, you know, we have some hydrogen schemes already, the hydrogen bus scheme. 
uh, in Aberdeen, for example, doing some good work with hydrogen, with the or with Orkney Island Councils in relation to ferry vessels, but also potentially uh, other vehicles and vessels as well. So, yeah, technology neutral. Don't put all your eggs in one basket and let's see what the market dictates. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Minister, uh, a, a couple of questions, quick questions about the Northern Isles ferry services and the, the fact that, uh, as been alluded to earlier, the ferry procurement, uh, or not in fact it wasn't, a bigger part, ferry procurement policy. Now, that's yet to be announced, but last month, Scottish Government uh, funded CML purchasing three of the Northern Isles vessels. Is that not a bit premature? No, no, no. I, I would try not to conflate the two. I, can, I suppose I can understand from, from perception why it might, might look like that. But um, the reason for purchasing the vessels were, were really twofold. Uh, one was the lease expiry was coming up and uh, we wanted to secure these vessels for that, uh, whether it's tendered or whether it's directly awarded. Um, so uh, that, that is one. Uh, the second thing is that it would be a suspend to save measure. I can't go into the exact detail because, again, it's commercially confidential, but it's fair to say that we're saving millions of pounds from uh, from purchasing these vessels as opposed to uh, longer-term leasing arrangements that we could have entered into. That direct saving, I should say, is directly funding the RET scheme. So, uh, you know, that is a, a spend to save measure, but it doesn't preempt uh, whether I directly award or tender the Northern Ireland's ferry service. That's good news. Um, a brief question, uh, one I've posed to you twice in the Chamber now, Minister, and that is with regard to ferry procurement, whether you've given thought, well, I know you've given thought, whether you've come to a conclusion about involving CalMAC and, importantly, the trade unions in the ferry procurement policy. I, I, I think that would be a very positive step if you would take it. Yes, and I will, and I have, I think, committed on, on both the answers to this question to, to absolutely do that. I think it's a very sensible and, and reasonable step uh, for the member to propose. What I would say is, first, I absolutely have to come to a final decision on Northern Isles, whether to procure or to tender. So I went up to Shetland and Orkney a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a few weeks ago now, uh, and, and spoke to stakeholders there, including the unions, I should say, but also to, to uh, councillors and, 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 and other stakeholders. And I will come to a final conclusion on this, um, you know, uh, later this month. So it won't be a, it won't be a matter of weeks and weeks that the members waiting for me to come to a final conclusion uh, on that. Once I make a final conclusion on that, uh, we will then absolutely engage with unions, with stakeholders, with the public around what their expectations are for the specifications uh, of, of the future uh, of the NIFS uh, contract, whether that's directly awarded, frankly, or not. Um, and the clear message already coming from stakeholders is capacity. So clearly we've got to look at how we can increase both for freight uh, and for passengers. That is the number one issue coming forward so far. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And the uh, last question, I think, is Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, the... 18-month extension to the procurement um, was announced in February 2017. Can you tell us why such a long extension was required? And you also talk about capacity, which um, is, is very relevant at the moment. Would you um, agree to look at a proposal from uh, Pentland Ferries to extend the route that he currently has from Caithness to Orkney and look at a Caithness to Shetland route as well? Um, so a couple of things. Uh, on the 18-month extension, absolutely needed because uh, if we go down the tendering route, then all of the processes that we have to go through for tendering, you know, in terms of pre-qualification, the invitation to tender, etc., etc., they all need a period of time. Uh, and therefore, uh, if we didn't have an 18-month uh, extension, there'd be a real danger of the service finishing and there not being a service. So the 18 months is a, is a kind of worst case scenario, uh, but it is really tight, hence why I have to come to a conclusion on this within uh, by the end of the month so that we can then progress whether it's direct award. And even direct award will take time if that is the route we go down, will still take uh, time that we have to go through in order to satisfy TKL exemption and so on and so forth. Uh, on the second question, um, on regular dialogue with Pentland Ferries, um, on, on, on the rollout of RET, I uh, spoke to Mr Banks and his family uh, just a couple of days ago and um, they didn't raise this proposal because we were talking on a different matter. Uh, if the member or indeed Andrew Banks uh, or indeed any operator wish to talk to me about uh, uh, expanding their services, then they can do that. Uh, but it is worth noting, of course, that uh, you know that is not a is not within our current contract uh, any other route uh, other than the Aberdeen routes that she knows of and the Scrabs to Stromness route, again, which she's familiar with. Um, so uh, if there was uh, a conversation, we'd have to look at the budgetary uh, implications, et cetera, et cetera. But I've not been approached, I have to say, 
by Pentland Ferries on that. Thank you very much, Minister. And that brings us to the end of this part of uh, the committee meeting. So I'd like to briefly suspend the panel to allow a changeover. I'd ask all, panel, uh, all members of the committee to be back within five minutes, please, so we can complete the next stage. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We're now going to move on to agenda item two, which is the Parking Code of Practice Bill, which is UK Parliament legislation. It relates to the committee's consideration of a legislative consent memorandum lodged by Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Connectivity. The LCM relates to the Parking Code of Practice Bill currently being considered in the House of Commons. As a lead committee, we are required to reflect upon the memorandum and then consider whether we are content with its terms. We then will report our findings to the Parliament. I'd like to welcome back from the Scottish Government the Hamza Yusuf, the Minister for Transport in the Islands, George Henry, the Head of Road Policy, Anne Cairns, a solicitor, and Sharon Wood, the Senior Road Policy Officer. Minister, would you like to make a brief opening statement? I got the emphasis. Uh, thank you, Convener. Grateful for today's opportunity to uh, address the committee in respect to the motion lodged by the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as you know, the UK Parking Code of Practice Bill was introduced in the House of Commons on the 19th of July and um, will shortly begin its Westminster Committee stages. The bill aims to regulate practices of the private parking industry via the single code of conduct that will replace the system of self-regulation which operates in private parking industry with more effective regulation that balances fairness to the motoring public with, of course, the rights to landowners to manage uh, their land. Uh, some of the provisions within the bill are reserved. However, the majority of those uh, do fall within the legislative competence of this parliament, therefore an LCM being required. Perhaps worth specifically concentrating on the areas covered by uh, the motion. I'll happily address any other queries, of course, uh, during the questioning. Uh, LCM covers two areas, the development of the parking code of practice and the delegation of functions in terms of the development of the code of practice, which I think is the most significant of interest uh, to the general public, uh, will be to improve the operation and management of private parking facilities by regulating how operators enforce parking matters. The code is expected to provide good practice and guidance on the handling of appeals against parking charges imposed by or indeed on behalf of private parking operators. Now, currently, private parking operators can charge for parking, but only those operators who are members of uh, ATA's accredited uh, trade associations such as the BPA, uh, British Parking Association, or indeed the IPC, the independent parking uh, community. Uh, to maintain access to keeper data, operators must adhere to the trade association's code of practices uh, such code of practices are developed within the industry. However, um, you know, audits that have been undertaken between trade associations and the DVLA have identified inconsistent and perhaps, uh, I could say, questionable activities by some uh, operators. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, other provisions uh, within the bill, delegation of, of functions, the UK and Scottish Government uh, do not have a say in the development and maintenance of the code of practices that are currently used. Uh, Sir Greg Knight's bill does seem to address that issue directly and also includes measures to allow the Secretary of State to enter into agreement with another public authority to perform any of the functions of altering the code. Extending this provision to Scotland will enable Scottish ministers in agreement with the Secretary of State to alter the code in the future if there are specific issues affecting Scotland that the code uh, has not already addressed, although, as I've indi indicated, consistency of approach within, uh, throughout Scotland, England and Wales is fundamentally the aim of this work. Out uh, with uh, issues of this bill to conclude, uh, convener, uh, as you know, of course, uh, Murdoch Fraser's, Fraser's uh, recent proposal uh, is similar to Sir Greg Knight's, however, there are some differences. Uh, the first on keeper liability, which currently doesn't apply to private parking in Scotland, and the second on the issue of single independent appeals uh, body in order to just save time. It's fair to say I'm very open-minded to looking at those proposals, but how that we can further uh, take them forward uh, with uh, the member and my officials, uh, principally uh, George Henry uh, and, and Sharon Wood have been involved in those discussions with Murder Fraser, and we look to take them forward as constructively as we can. Thank you, Minister, and, and thank you also for prompting me. I should have welcomed Murdo Fraser to the committee, so I apologise for not doing it the, at, that at the outset. There are several questions relating to this, uh, this LCM, and I'd like to start off with Mike Rommels, followed by John Mason. Thank you, thank you Convener. Um, I hope you don't consider my questions in this phase to be out of touch, Minister. Um, so what are the differences between Scotland and England with private companies requesting information from the DVLA? What are the differences? And should people expect that a government agency keeps their personal information private and not sell it on to private companies? 
Well, in terms of the differences in, 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 in the law uh, in Scotland and that has uh, in England and Wales, um, and how will the LCM kind of resolve this? I mean, the law on private parking charges uh, in Scotland and England and Wales is similar in practical terms. Sir Greg Knight's bill in the LCM aims to support that consistency for the benefit uh, of the motorists and parking operators. The main difference is that issue of keeper liability. Uh, for charges uh, which is in place in England and Wales, whereas in Scotland, <coughs> to recover charges, it's necessary to establish who entered the contract with the parking operator uh, well, in practice. And what does that mean? Who, who it was that uh, parked or, or drove that vehicle? So keeper liability is an issue. I'm also aware of the context we are currently in, and, and this is only enhanced now in relation to data, data protection, data security, and in that regard, Mike Rumble is absolutely, as he often is, is in touch with the public mood. Uh, and, and I think that's important for us to take forward uh, uh, when it comes to discussions on keeper liability. And a serious, uh, you know, there are some serious questions around how we ensure that uh, individuals are protected while those landowners, uh, 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 trade associations and others absolutely have the right uh, to, to find out who it was that uh, in some cases broke their contract and therefore are liable for penalties. So there is a fine balance to find there and, and, and that is why I'm happy to take forward any issues around keeper liability as constructively as possible. My question is, in Scots law you've got a private contract between an individual and another individual or company and yet that company is able uh, to ignore data protection laws and ask the DVLA for that information held by the government, by an individual citizen. That strikes me as not perhaps correct. Um, and I really want to find out from your minister whether you believe that's the case. And if we agree to the LCM, are we allowing that to happen uh, in this age of data protection? My official George Henry to come in a bit more detail, but the, the LCM doesn't address the keeper liability issue. That's an issue we're going to have to take forward separately, and, and we're happy to do that, as I say, constructively with, 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 with Murdoch Fries and others that have an interest uh, in this. And clearly, data protection will absolutely be a part of that, but it's not what's covered in, in the LCM that we're taking forward just now. But perhaps John Henry will come with more detail. Yeah, I mean, just to come in on the point, um, it can only be. Um, car park operators who are members of an accredited trade association who can obtain um, information via, um, of keeper liability for um, as part of the you know their process um, the under data protection under the proposed code of practice it will need to ab apply with all the laws that are there at the moment so moving forward um, data protection then therefore shouldn't really be um, an issue w you know with the proposed code of practice used because if, if an individual, if I give my details to the government, a government agency, I expect the government agency to keep that confidential, but I understand that it sells that information or it charges another individual or a company for that information. And it just strikes me that um, that is not protecting our data. The, the, well, the, whoever the driver of the vehicle within Scotland as it currently stands, when they enter um, into a car park, they're entering into a contractual agreement um, with the, the landowner. And the terms and conditions um, sh should be clearly defined. It's an arrangement, isn't it? It's a private arrangement. Yeah, so that's my question. It's a private arrangement. We all know that. So why is the government selling this information that it has about individual citizens? A couple of things to say. First of all, we don't have keeper liability here in Scotland, so this is a question about do we take this forward and all of these considerations around data should be taken into consideration or will be taken into consideration. Uh, but I would say that we, George is absolutely right. You enter into that contract with the accredited, perhaps, uh, trade association. It's only right then that if you break or violate that contract that they're then able to get information on who it was that did that within the confines of data protection law, etc, etc, etc. Because therefore, how could they then find out who was parking that vehicle, driving that vehicle, so on and so forth. And I think that is a, there is a, a balance, I think if the member is absolutely correct, there's a balance that uh, we have to get right. Uh, within, within government and that would be part of the consideration if we chose to take keeper liability forward. But it is important that that is not what the LCM is necessarily addressing here. Does the government make a profit, and therefore will the Scottish government make a profit from selling this information on? Yeah. Um, I, 
Okay, well, we asked my, my officials to come in on this. I'm not entirely sure about uh, whether or not the UK government or the DVLA would, because, of course, it's not under my control or a function under my control. Certainly, the Scottish government wouldn't uh, make a profit on this. Um, DVLA is a reserved uh, agency of the government, the UK government, so mm. no. From that, because, <laughs> because you know, seriously, if if if, if the U, if we're passing a law, if we're giving an LCM for the UK Parliament to pass a law and it's making money from the motorist, I, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with this one. I, uh, Mike, Mike, there are other questions. I mean, okay. you, do you have other questions on that? You, you suggested you may have more than two. No, we'll, we'll leave it there. OK, well, maybe well, well, some of the answers to the other questions may help you. So we'll move to John, and then I'll come back to you at the end if you want, John. Thanks, Convener. It was more of a kind of overarching question from myself as to whether it should be an LCM or whether we should be doing our own legislation, because within the um, briefings we received, it says that the bill makes provision on devolved matters with only a few clauses relating to reserve matters, so it does sound like it's largely dealing with devolved areas. And um, we were also told that, at the moment, private parking is largely governed by contract law, which, as I understand it, would be slightly different in Scotland from it is south of the border. So, given these points, would it be better for us just to legislate in the whole area ourselves, or why go with an LCM? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that um, there is a consistency in approach around uh, the, the approach taken in England and Wales and Scotland, which I think merits uh, that, that the LCM uh, being brought forward. I think there's, um, there's a good reason to have some level of consistency around uh, appeals, around the code of practice, I should say. I think that is, uh, there is logic in that, there is sense in, in doing that. Therefore, uh, I think the LCM uh, should, should absolutely be passed. Um, it's also, of course, that bill is now making its way through the Parliament. It seems to me, uh, you know, considering our own parliamentary timetable, and I know how constrained that is, taking a couple of bills through the Parliament uh, myself at the moment, that, uh, you know, there is, I don't think, need to necessarily duplicate. Where Sir Greg's Knight bill uh, doesn't address issues, I would say that Murdo Fraser's bill has come in and, and is helping to fill uh, some of those gaps, and I'm more than happy to, as I say, work constructively uh, on that, but there's a sense, I think, and a logic in having a, a code of practice that has consistency between uh, England and Wales and, and Scotland. Okay, thank you. Um, Richard, you're the next one. Question: Will this bill stop any wheel clamping and exorbitant charges, uh, or would we need uh, Murdo Fraser's extra amendments in order to ensure that that didn't happen to unfortunate motorists? Yeah. Uh, the code will cover that latter point. In terms of wheel clamping, I'll maybe uh, go on to my uh, ask for the technical expertise from my, my officials, but my understanding from reading on this is that we have laws uh, against wheel clamping in, in, in Scotland, so that doesn't exist as a practice or shouldn't exist as a practice uh, in Scotland. But I'll just look towards the legal experts uh, to, to make sure I'm correct. They're nodding their heads, so it sounds like I've, <laughs> I've got it right. Hi, and, and just quickly, uh, am I right in saying that the police, insurance companies, and also some read-only car parts have you access to DVLA to get your personal data for your, your car registration. You know, people can tell me, even over the phone, what colour my car is, what type, of, what type of car it is, because I've gave them my... So everybody now has access to the DVLA um, information, am I right? Everybody know... Uh... Well, most people. Well, <laughs> again, I'm not sure how you'd uh, define uh, it or not, but I think the point being is it would have to be part of accredited trade associations yeah. and uh, BPA or, or the IPC in that regard. And, uh, you know, there are data protection measures uh, in place. But I go back to my, my, my point to Mike Rumbles. We are in a, a place and a space at the moment, quite rightly, where uh, there are questions around data protection, how widely it's shared, and so on and so forth. And any consideration we give to extending keeper liability up here in Scotland, we'd have to, 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 to take all those matters into consideration. I mean, for what it's worth, I think Mike Rumbles' points made at the beginning of this were, 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 were absolutely, uh, you know, considerations that we have to take and then the ones that Dick Lyle also brings forward are ones that I absolutely have to take. People are understandably more nervous about giving out the data now perhaps more than they ever have been and we know the recent uh, legislation on GDPR and, uh, and other such data uh, protection measures. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, there are issues for consideration but there are at the moment checks and balances in place which I'm 
generally content with, but I would need to look at them in more detail uh, if we do intend to extend keeper liability, which I'm, I'm supportive of. Minister, the next question is from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you. I'll just make the observation, cars are the only vehicle where uh, ownership details are not published. Aircraft, ships, I uh, can go in and buy a birth, death, marriage certificate for anybody. Uh, so I, I don't get this one. But however, my question is on section six of uh, Sir Greg Knight's uh, uh, bill, uh, which essentially is the part of uh, his bill, uh, which basically I have no great issue with the bill as a whole, uh, which just simply allows uh, the powers that are granted with this bill to be devolved to Scottish ministers. Now, I note that the bill doesn't affect executive competence or legislative competence. It's simply about a code of conduct. But there's one thing it says, and that is it allows the Secretary of State to cancel uh, that delegation to Scottish ministers at any time. Um, is the government comfortable with that provision, or is that a standard provision of uh, administrative devolution? I might look towards my uh, the, the legal expert uh, Anne Cairns in, in that regard. I have to say the conversation with the UK uh, government and, and the conversations I've had with uh, the Department for Transport on this have been very constructive. Uh, although uh, he's absolutely right, um, it would enable Scottish ministers an agreement with the Secretary of State uh, to alter the code if there were specific issues affecting Scotland. Um, you know, we would expect it to take forward and be taken forward in, in, in that spirit. But in terms of the legal aspect of it, I might ask perhaps uh, more appropriately our uh, legal advisor on this, Anne Cairns, to, to come in on that. Um, it does include um, the ability to, for the Secretary of State to delegate the functions to the Scottish ministers, but um, it's not just the Scottish ministers, it would be other public authorities as well. Um, so I would imagine, so yes, it, you're, you're correct to say that subsection 4 does allow the Secretary of State to cancel the agreement at any time, but I would imagine that as regards the Scottish Government, um, there would be consultation um, about that before they take any such step. It seems to me that it would be more appropriate for it just to be cancelled if they were talking about another public authority. Um, involved in and through through the, the the working group, and I think Shan attends on a, on a regular basis for us. Um, there is good conversation and consultation at the moment with the UK government in relation to the code of practice, what it should look like, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the the relationship now that doesn't fear this future proof, of course. Uh, but uh, for 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 what it's worth, uh, you know, I don't have uh, you know any difficulty in saying that I, I, I you know I think we would be uh, uh, treated in this regard with the delegation of functions uh, as, as a constructive partner in that process. Thank you, uh, Thank you um, convener. This is a, a, an issue of considerable interest to many of my constituents. I've got many hundreds of, of cases from individuals who have been hit with unfair penalty notices, and I know, you know other members will have similar experience. And it's an issue not just in Scotland, and, and, but UK-wide, which is why I think having a, a UK-wide code of practice actually makes sense. I've recently concluded a, a consultation on the proposed members' bill. There were five elements that I uh, consulted on. Uh, the first was capping of, of penalty charges. The second was the better regulation of the signage in car parks. The third was the uh, regulation of appearance of penalty charge notices. The fourth was creating an independent appeal system in Scotland. And the fifth was uh, keeper liability, which the minister has referred to. Um, my uh, reading of, of, of Sir Greg Knight's bill, and I should say I met Sir Greg Knight in Westminster in, in February and discussed it, is a code of practice potentially could cover at least three of these elements. But I'd be interested to get you know, the Minister's thoughts on, on how far and how broad the scope of a code of practice would be in terms of addressing some of these concerns. I think I think the the approach uh, is that uh, the approach taken by Sir Greg Knight uh, is is one that uh, uh, gives us a consistent framework across England, Wales, and Scotland. I'm, I'm I'm very supportive of that. I think of the five issues he's consulted on, really the the only two that we'd have to take forward in consultation and in conversation with Murdo would be around uh, the independent appeals process uh, and keeper liability. I think Sir Greg's Knight bills uh, address uh, the other issues that he's looking to address. On the two that he mentions at the end there, the Keeper Liability and Independent Appeals process, I'm very open-minded and, and favourable uh, to, to, to both. So, um, you know, I think we can...
can work on this. Uh, I certainly think passing the LCM would be a good step in getting some of the other issues addressed and moved in line relatively quickly. Uh, and then on the other two issues, as I say, we should then turn to, well, we already are having a constructive conversation, we should continue it in that vein. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I, should have, I should have said at the start, Convener, I very much acknowledge um, and thank the Minister for the very constructive engagement I've had with him and his officials in this, and I hope we are um, planning to meet in the near future to discuss the next steps. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, there, there doesn't appear to be a, any more uh, questions, so at this stage I think I'd like to ask our members to, to content to recommend that the Parliament agree to the draft motion and approve the legislative consent motion. Yes. That's agreed. Thank you very much, everyone, and to the witness for, for witnesses to, to, for attending and also for the Minister uh, for attending. And that concludes today's committee business. Thank you. Thank you. I now close the meeting. <laughs>